good morning and thank you for giving me this opportunity to present today. I'm Amy Wilson, I'm from the University of Birmingham and like many of you I have a real passion for improving maternal health. Uh, I'm a midwife but my real interest is in reducing maternal death in low resource settings and today I'm going to share with you something quite controversial, something, an intervention that I looked at in my PhD and this is symphysiotomy. So what is symphysiotomy? Well, it's the artificial separation of the symphysis pubis with a surgical instrument, normally a scalpel, and it's done to enlarge the pelvic diameter to facilitate birth. It can widen the diameter by about two and a half centimetres. It doesn't require an extensive operating theatre, an anaesthetist, or lots of specialist equipment. It can be done by a doctor, by a clinical officer, or a midwife, with a scalpel, a urinary catheter, and done under local anaesthetic. So what about symphysiotomy? Well, it's a procedure that everybody who knows about it seems to have an opinion on. Discussion and debate seem to unearth the highly polarised views that surround this procedure. In fact, when I've spoken about it with clinicians, many state that it is obsolete and it should remain that way, that it is a procedure that, that has no place in modern obstetrics. But if that is the case, then why does it still appear in textbooks and in guidelines, and why is it still discussed in some obstetric care courses? So let's look at the guidelines where we see it. Here we see it in the RCOG guidelines in the management for breach in entrapment after the, uh, in the after coming head. We see it in the management of shoulder dystocia in line with the Zeffinelli man manoeuvre when all others fail. We see it here in textbooks. Now, many of these are actually on the essential reading list for our medical, our medical students. But not only do we see it in the management of breach and shoulder dystocia, as I've already stated, we actually see it in the treatment of obstructed labour. But as evidence-based practitioners, of course we want to know the evidence that surrounds this procedure. Well, the RCOG guideline tells us that evidence for symphysiotomy in terms of breach and shoulder dystocia is level four. Now, this means that, is, that it is obtained from committee reports or based on clinical experience. It falls under the grade C recommendation. And this indicates an absence of directly applicable clinical studies of good quality. So this is the case for breach and shoulder dystocia. Let's look at the evidence for fetopelvic disproportion, so in the case of obstructed labour, say. Let's look at what Cochrane and the uh, Reproductive Health Library have to say. So the Reproductive Health Library tells us that there's no experimental data on the advantages or the disadvantages of symphysiotomy when compared to alternative interventions. Now that bit's quite important because we're presuming that there is an alternative intervention to hand. The Cochrane group tell us that there's no randomised control trials and that there's controversy surrounding this procedure and that guidelines should be based on the best available evidence. So I wondered what evidence was actually out there. So I performed a systematic review and looked on Medline, Embase, uh, the Cochrane Library, African Index Medicus, to name a few. Um, I looked for any studies that um, looked at symphysiotomy and I used this as a search term with any other MeSH terms. And between, uh, out of seven, uh, four, 579 hits, I found seven comparative studies. And as Cochrane stated, there were no randomised trials out there. Now, I know this is an incredibly busy slide, but I just want to use it to point out a few important points. If I can work the pointer. So, all of the studies uh, compared symphysiotomy with caesarean section. And they were all sets in developing countries. The dates range from uh, uh, 1960s to 2006. There were four prospective studies. There were three retrospective studies. Two studies matched in time to the next procedure that was conducted for CPD, and other studies didn't report on this. Most of the studies matched in terms of patient characteristics. Now, as we have already said, these aren't randomised control trials, and they're not the level 1A evidence that we normally like. Yet it is still important to assess the quality of this data. So we did this using the Newcastle-Ottawa scale. 
and most of these scored low risk of bias for selection, medium risk of bias for comparability, and low to medium risk of bias for outcome assessment. We also checked the, uh, the reporting of the studies, uh, and this was using the strobe checklist. Two of the studies were relatively sketchy in their reporting, but the rest reported in a more comprehensive manner. So what happens when we meta-analyse the data? Well, first, let's look at maternal death. We've, our analysis contains 1,200 patients here, and we see that there's no difference between symphysiotomy and caesarean section for maternal death. What about if we look at perinatal, de perinatal death? We've got 1,100 births in this data set, and again, we can see Similarly, there's no difference between symphysiotomy and caesarean section with perinatal death. What happens if we look at neonatal death? This was a less reported outcome, with only two studies reporting on this and 300 births. And we find that there's no difference between symphysiotomy and caesarean section for neonatal death. What about if we look at postpartum hemorrhage? We have three studies reporting on this with around 650 women in the data set. And again, we see no difference between symphysiotomy and caesarean section for postpartum hemorrhage. But what happens if we look at infection? There are 850 women in this data set. But interestingly, we can see a reduction in the risk of infection by about 70% with symphysiotomy compared to caesarean section. It becomes interesting when we look at fistula. So we have 800 uh, women in this data set, and we can see that there's an increase in, fist in the risk of fistula with, with, um, when a woman has a symphysiotomy compared to if she has a caesarean section. So lastly, let's look at incontinence. This data set contains around um, 1,000 women, and we can clearly see an increase in incontinence with symphysiotomy. And this is important because it alludes to the urinary incontinence at the time of postnatal care, so why the women are still in hospital. This isn't long-term uh, incont urinary incontinence. But symphysiotomy isn't just a sort of short-term issue. When we talk about symphysiotomy, we often think about the long-term problem. So we've got three studies here that reported on the long-term follow-up of these patients, and they all reported at different time points. And the first study reported... Uh, post-procedure up to 10 years. The second study reported between 10 and 13 years. And uh, the third study reported between 2 and 10 years. And the outcomes that they reported on were pain on walking, pain on dancing, pain on jumping, pain on lifting, pain on intercourse, incontinence, back pain and scar pain. And all of the studies showed no difference in long-term outcomes except for scar pain where that was more significant in the caesarean section group with only one study. <laughs> but why is this even important? Why am, I, why am I even interested in symphysiotomy as a treatment for obstructed labour when there is a fantastic evidence base out there on the safety and effectiveness, even the types of sutures that one should use in caesarean section? Well, it's because obstructed labour causes 9% of maternal deaths worldwide. And infection and hemorrhage are other very common causes, both of which are more likely with caesarean section, and particularly if it's carried out in a facility with limited resources or in suboptimal conditions. But these factors are not, are not of our concern here in the UK when we are dealing with obstructed labour. Caesarean section is considered a safe procedure. Very rarely do we as UK clinicians experience maternal death. It is in sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia where our mothers are dying. When we look at the care women re are receiving across the globe, we can see that almost all of our births in high-income high income countries are attended by skilled birth attendants. Yet if we look, in, look at low-income countries, this is only around half. If we look at births by caesarean section, we can see that in high-income countries, this is around 30% yet in low-income countries, around 60%. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's much lower. But why is that? Well, it's because women in low-income countries and high-income countries do not have equal access to good quality care. A woman in a low-income country 
For a woman in low, in low income country, there may be no doctor available to perform caesarean section that she needs. A woman may not be able to make the eight hour journey on foot or on bicycle to reach a hospital. A woman may not be able to afford the cost of a caesarean section, or she may fear the cultural repercussions that she may face if she does not give birth vaginally. So it is for these women that I ask this question. Could symphysiotomy be an option in low resource settings? It is interesting that for an intervention with exposure in guidelines, textbooks and emergency training courses, there is a shocking scarcity of evidence. Better designed, carefully evaluated studies are needed, but these studies will need to make sure that the procedure is conducted in an appropriate fashion and by adequately trained individuals. For if nothing else, this review does highlight the possibility of causing harm in terms of fistula formation. Following appropriate evaluations, my hunch is that this procedure will have a role in certain circumstances. It has been with us for a long time, it is refusing to go away, and I think there is good reason for this. Thank you. I'd also like to thank my co-authors.